Thank you, Judy. Um, really good to be here, everyone. Um, I'm covering, as some of you know, for my colleague Chris Taylor, who's unfortunately unwell um, and has been for some while. We're hoping to see her back with us in the autumn, um, but meanwhile I'll be looking after some of her areas of work. Um, as Judy said earlier, um, this last year, NIAS, was, NIAS is the National Institute of Adult and Continuing Education, for those of you who are new to us. Um, and we, last year, we were commissioned to carry out three interlinked pieces of research. Um, Biz, um, through what, well, Bill Hallahan now has picked this up, um, asked us to look at quality and progression issues in ESOL. The Skills Funding Agency, part of Biz, um, asked us to look at the impact of the changes that they made to the funding of ESOL, which um, obviously Judy and Jenny have just talked about. And um, the Greater London Authority looked as, asked us to look at appropriate ESOL opportunities for refugees and migrants in London in, in the light of various things. One is potential new models um, reflecting big society and also, again, in the light of the skills funding agency changes. So these three pieces of work were carried out together. Now, obviously, the ownership of the data and the final reports of those pieces of work rests with the commissioning authorities in each case. So I'm not able to actually give you access to those, but what I am able to do is just share a little bit of, of what we've found. I'm hoping by the time of your conference in July for the Natekla conference that we're able to share a little bit more, but it will depend on um, what the commissioning agencies um, would like us to do with that uh, with that work. Um, I know that Bill Hallahan is committed to being able to share at least some of it, um, and we're hoping we're meeting with him in a couple of weeks' time. And I'm hoping from that to have more of a clue about where we can take all our findings. Very little of what we find, I have to say, will be any surprise to most of you. Um, I don't think that there was enormous amounts of new information out there, but what's been incredibly useful has been able to gather those findings, and thank you very much to those of you whose institutions and organisations took part, and it's absolutely vital to us that our membership engages with this. Um, and so it's been incredibly good to have so much response. We had very, very positive responses in the sense that there were lots of them. Unfortunately, what you had to say was um, largely not quite so positive as um, Jenny's described already. The ESOL um, scenario right now is not at its best. Um, the um, obvious barriers to entry continue, and they were at least temporarily exacerbated. For some groups of people, they continue and have got worse. Um, so for certain groups of women, certain groups of people who were already excluded from free courses, um, but, and then other people who came into exclusion because of then a drop in provision, even if that provision was temporary. So overall, we found a, a huge dip in numbers taking up ESOL provision, largely because there was less of it at the start of, last academic, of this academic year. Um, however, by February, the numbers had picked up, but they weren't the same learners, necessarily. So as far as we can tell, this kind of data, as you know, is, is hugely um, difficult to get um, accurate. Um, ILR data, um, learner record data, comes through too slowly, um, and also is, is not necessarily going to pick up quite a lot of learners in this sector. So we've been flagging up things where there's, you know, gaps in data all the way through. Um, the usual mix of barriers to entry also, can, uh, also pertain, and so does new things around qualifications and so on. Um, some of those ones are not new, as I've said. You know, those barriers are, are completely familiar about access to learning. Um, but because of the changes in who is learning ESOL, um, largely the numbers have kept up through Job Centre Plus referrals. But Job Centre Plus referrals and the kind of learning that they lead to is a very different pros prospect from, um, as, you, as many of you will be aware, um, from a, an open entry system for those who might need it. And then, obviously, the eligibility criteria come in, but that's, that's a, different, a different issue. Um, 
there are different types of free provision. There was some displacement. That was some of the things we looked at. You know, were people going to take up? If there wasn't any ESOL, were you going to take up something else instead as a proxy? There was some displacement, far less than I think the people who commissioned us had expected. And probably, I mean, whether you're all disguising it in your institutions, we can't tell. And perhaps you are. Um, but um, it was less negative as well. You know, it wasn't cynical, it wasn't negative. The displacement take up actually turned out to be really useful for people that they were able to take up perhaps something which was also enhancing an employability skill while increasing their language um, and so long as the provider can do that professionally well and with high quality that was seen actually to be positive however um, we did find that only some of the larger providers had been able to do that. And there was displacement into the voluntary and community sector, but only where the provision was led by volunteers and free. And then it's very hard to track. Um, but generally, the smaller providers in the voluntary and community sector have been the most disadvantaged by the changes. They're, they're the least able to carry on providing. Um, that also we'll come back to perhaps to the job center plus plus issue um there's a there is reduced prov provision um especially at entry level and some providers were able to fairly swiftly reverse the changes when the um when the funding rules slightly relaxed last august um, but some couldn't get that on board straight away and some still haven't been able to um I've already mentioned that there were issues about data accuracy, but there's also a real issue about measures of success and how those are being recorded. And that's something we've gone back with, with further queries on because it turns out that different arms of government are actually measuring both um, success and achievement in completely different ways. So the data sources are, you won't, you know, nobody's going to look too surprised about sort of lack of joined upness and lack of coordination. But, um, but nevertheless, um, that does seem to be something we're going to have to struggle with if they want us to be able to report on these things with any level of accuracy, um, with the, with the um, in, intention then to make recommendations about how to do it better. It's a bit hard if you can't get hold of the, any data or the right data, or then to discover that people are using three sets of data, um, all of which are contradictory. I mentioned um, Job Centre Plus referrals. These have had a, a considerable impact, um, not least because of very differing expectations between what uh, the Department of Work and Pensions through Job Centre Plus anticipate that um, we can do in the sector and, um, and what is actually possible when learning a language. Um, and so, but also not really th being able to think about that in a very, um, in a very across departmental way. And this is overwhelmingly one of our recommendations that there's such a need um, for better cross departmental working uh, between biz, uh, Department of Work and Pensions, Communities and Local Government, the UKBA, and the Skills Funding Agency. And all of those people currently have entirely different expectations, not just of ESOL, but of ESOL too. Um, it's really, really unhelpful because some of those policies then become contradictory, making it impossible to improve quality and progression and so on. Um, so, We've also raised some of the issues that Judy and Jenny and Melanie have raised uh, ourselves, so I won't go into those more now, but particular issues around people in low paid employment, particular issues about people in the workplace and trying to progress, um, and particularly about uh, el eligibility confusions carrying on. All of those will be part of the recommendations in those, in those reports. Earlier this week, NIAS happened to hold a seminar for, um, for learning providers in general on unemployed and vocational skills uh, work, including working with SMEs and micro-businesses. Um, and that, alongside that, was a joint presentation from BIS and the Department for Work and, and Pensions about the introduction of universal credit next autumn. And this is something that various campaigns and, and you as an association may wish to be aware of. Um, if they can get the IT system together, and one does have to have just a small moment of doubt about government's ability with big <laughs> IT systems that do joined up work, 
Um, if they can do it, then the introduction of universal credit will have serious implications for eligibility. BIS is currently conducting um, some informal consultation, and this may lead to a formal consultation. And I believe details are on the BIS website. I would urge you to look at that because that because again for ESOL learners who are particularly vulnerable anyway in the system, these things will have an enormous impact. Um, current proposals for um, universal credit will also go out to consultation and again you may not normally look at consultations on Department of Work and Pensions website but I would urge you to because it's going to have an enormous impact on our learners. So those are, those are forthcoming things that, uh, to keep aware of. Now, there was already an indication from the audience that ESOL is, a, a key, is of key concern all in unemployment and vocational skill development and helping people back into work, not only because of the Job Centre Plus referral route. Um, those of you from smaller and voluntary sector providers, you may not even be so aware of Job Centre Plus referrals because m minimum contract levels have applied to it. So it tends to be only coming through the larger um, providers. So, um, but it's just a, a, a thing that if you're unemployed and you now can have a mandatory referral for learning. And Job Centre Plus advisors may send you, and I'll just, just give you an example, on a two-week ESOL course, <laughs> which the provider has to provide. You can imagine how handy that's going to be for anybody. Um, really help them get into work quickly. So, and so therefore what we need to be thinking about is, is perhaps cleverer ways to develop in-work provision. But, um, but again, that has suffered huge reductions because of lack of avail availability of funding, which employers in the past could access to support that learning. That's, a lot of that's gone. So there's less of that too. So that's the kind of work we've been doing. We are going to be um, producing our recommendations from, from, those, uh, from those three pieces of research, and we hope to be leading into some more work done this year to see how that's panning out in practice, but also because the changes haven't stopped yet. Um, so those of you that are involved with various, um, various campaigns and, um, and your workers and association, just keep an eye on, on what we're doing and we'll also try to, albeit with a rather reduced staff capacity on this area at the moment, we'll try to keep people informed through our membership and um, interest groups as well. We have been doing some other projects which, um, which relate to this work and I think we'll, which will be of interest and I'll try and bring information about these to the conference. But just to mention, some of you already I think know about our um, uh, project around uh, refugee families and fostering, which has been um, running um, for the last couple of years. And um, we should be disseminating that um, in the summer. Uh, we've also been running a smaller couple of projects, one about migrant skills validation, which is an ongoing piece of work that I've been involved with in NICE for a long time. Um, we've had various projects over the years, um, and that's about trying to get um, improved recognition for the skills and qualifications which migrants have, migrants of all kinds when they arrive in the country, um, and, and to work with that in, in plugging skills gaps. And obviously part of that provision is always the need for English language learning for some people. Um, we've been running a, a small Grundtvig funded project on English, called English for Seniors, which is a, a, it's a very tiny project, but it's about trying to think about how older learners could have greater influence over their curriculum. Um, and um, I'll just flag up as well, it's new onto the Department for Work and Pensions, European Social Fund website. We contributed to some research on gender and um, why women's outcomes through the ESF employability programs were not always very good, both recruitment into in some cases and, um, and movement into jobs in others. And we found, of course, that um, with some of the specialist voluntary sector providers, in fact, there was very, very good job progression rates. Um, and it's learning from the good practice. So the European Social Fund Directorate has published a good practice guide based on the research we did last year. Um, I can also, I've got a few hard copies back in the office, which um, if you wanted to contact me. Just flagging up then, while on the topic of ESF, there is going to be a formal consultation on the new um, European structural funds, including European Social Fund. Um, an item 
that you might just want to be aware of for the future is that the um, European Union and the UK government has welcomed it and supported it. We'll um, fund the structural funds now in, um, we'll reflect the localism agenda. There'll be four broad objectives in European Social Fund and ERDF and some of the other structural funds for the future. Those broad objectives could, are so broad, which is great on one level because you could include a lot of things in them, but will probably feed into, not yet clear, how any smaller organisations will get access to those funds because it will, again, feed into this whole thing about minimum contract levels, larger uh, provision, albeit locally determined. Um, and you may wish to have a think about whether certain groups of learners may be excluded from those provisions. When the consultation comes out, which won't be long now, the informal one's already happened. Um, they're hoping to run the formal consultation over the summer. It's for the funding round 2014 to, 20, to 2020. It's all based on European targets for 2020. So it's just a couple of bits of policy flagging of things that are coming your way. Um, things that you might not necessarily think about responding to because they don't say ESOL clearly in, in them, but they are going to have a huge impact on ESOL learners. Um, so that was just a brief roundup from NIACE. <laughs>